Good evening, welcome to the Shir. It's Sunday, Isru Chag HaShavuos. First day of Parshas Nosoi. Someone picked me up on the fact that last week I'd written that it was Sunday of Parshas Nosoi. Which is... Right, so, one a, I was speaking to a Shliach just the other day, and he's got or he's got guests who are likely they come to him Shabbos day. In all likelihood, they haven't heard Kiddush at night. So he's asking perhaps he should make the long Kiddush on Shabbos afternoon for the benefit of his guests. So let's read the basic halacha. So we have here from the Alter Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch and Simon Reshe Ein Aleph, the laws of Kiddush. Where we have Reim Shochach Oy Ovar Veloy Kiddush Balailo, if one forgot or violated and did not make Kiddush at night, Yeshle Tashlumin Lemochor, Kol Hayoim. So one can make up for it during Shabbos day. So the nighttime Kiddush, if it wasn't done at night, it can be done by day. Yoimar Kol HaKiddush Shel Halailo. So you'll say the full bracha of Kiddush, not the introduction of the chapter, the passage of, of Vayachulu, Vayachulu, but the long bracha will be said. So this is his question. Since his guests will not have had Kiddush at night, should he be doing the full Kiddush Shabbos afternoon? So... First of all, um, this, this is really not just an individual question. I'm sure in many Chabad houses, synagogues, there are going to be people who will not have heard Kiddush at night. And is it the right thing for the rabbi to make Kiddush for these people, to make the Kiddush at the Kiddush with a long bracha? I'm loath to say yes, because I don't like innovations putting it, changing, changing practices. Okay, people know that by day is a short Kiddush. Start introducing a long Kiddush is, is, is uh, in itself. I'm not very keen about that. But even on a, an, on a from another angle, here's the following question, questioning the, the value of doing so. These people, I presume, don't understand Hebrew. So I'm not talking about it, uh, it's a or you have a Chabad house for Israelis. By the way, I just was speaking to a shliach who specializes with Israelis. He says they only know about Friday night. It's much harder to get Israelis for Shabbos day. They're more tuned in to come a Friday night. So therefore, it's probably not such a relevant question for them. So now, back to you've got a non-Hebrew speaking. Does a person listening to a bracha who doesn't understand the meaning of those words. Is there a value in that bracha? So here the Alter Rebbe, in, this is in Simon Kuf Pei He, in the Halochas of Benching. So he says, it's important that you understand what you're saying. Other brachas, whether brachas on food, brachas of mitzvahs, bracha of Kiddush, which has been Hatoira, some say that your Yoytse in any language even if you don't understand. And similarly, Halil, so they maintain these are they are on, they, they maintain that you can fulfill these mitzvahs, even if you say them in a language that you don't understand. I was I had a ride in a taxi this afternoon, and the Afghani driver was listening to something. And I asked him, does he was listening to something in Arabic? So it's, although he doesn't, it is, that's not his language, he speaks Afghani, but he does understand a little bit of the of the Arabic for his prayers, whatever. So now here's the question Are you Yuitsa? Are you fulfilling the mitzvah of saying a brocha or hearing a brocha if you don't understand? So the first opinion says yes. Not benching, the benching has to be, I should understand, but these brochas, you are yotz even if you don't understand, and even if you'd say them in another language, which you don't understand, not only in Hebrew, according to this opinion, you're saying, even if, let's say, I would say a brocha in Arabic, which I don't understand at the moment, I would still be yotz. 
later on, it's a long chat, a long, long paragraph in the Alter of Narach, where Yesh Oimrim. Now, those who disagree with this, and they say, Shekola Brochus Henke Birchasa Mosel in Yonzeh. All brachas are comparable to Birchas Samozin in this respect. So just like Birchas Samozin, you have to understand what you're saying. The second opinion is saying that all brachas, which are listed earlier, would also fall into the same ruling, that if you don't understand, you're not Yotzer. Now, in this itself, in not understanding, they're saying it in Hebrew, which you don't understand, or saying it in another language, which you don't understand. Yeah. So again, if I would, according to the first opinion, if I would say a brach in Hungarian, which I don't really don't know any, any more than two words in Hungarian. So according to the first opinion, I'm yet if I say a brach in Hungarian. The second opinion is saying that no, you have to understand what you're saying. The fi svara chroin the bishal shoyn. So according to the latter svara. It's that it's as long as if it's not if it's Hebrew you're okay, but if it's other language it's imperative you understand. Of the Svara Rishoyna, according to the earlier Svara, even if it's in Hebrew you don't if you don't understand you're not Yotzer. So what we're seeing here is, are people Yotzer by saying brachas in a, which they don't understand? So there is an opinion which says that if it's in Hebrew you do you are Yotzer. There is an opinion that says no, you're not Yotzer even if it's in Hebrew. If you don't understand what you're saying. So therefore, that brings me to this question. Last night, Friday night, I made Kiddush. Now is a question, should I make Kiddush again for these people who have coming who, who uh, come to my Shabbos meal? But if they don't speak Hebrew, and so I'm saying a bracha just for them, it could be they're not yet in any case. So why introduce new stuff, which is questionable whether it has any value. It's a sophic brachas, so just don't do it. Let's move on to the next question. So this is only a Lubavitcher question. Someone who crossed the date line. So we know that the Rebbe, um, <clears throat> it was a big, a big surprise when the Rebbe came out with it, but the Rebbe took very strongly the idea, the view that if you cross the date line during Sphira, during the 49 days between Pesach and, and Shavuos, if you cross the date line, you, that affects when your when your Shavuos will be. So when, let's say, you get out, if you left Melbourne on a Wednesday and you travel for 12 hours, whatever, it was the end of Wednesday, and you come to LA and it's Wednesday. So you have two Wednesdays. As a result, you'll have 49 days sooner than the people in, in the United States. Because, because you had two Wednesdays, yes, you had an extra day. You had seven, you had eight days in that week. As a result, your Shavuos is going to start the 50th day, and it's going to be the fifth of Sivan. If it's the other way, if you cross the date line from, from LA to, to, to Melbourne, so then you're going to lose a day. You'll go from Monday straight into Wednesday. You'll lose Tuesday, for example. In which case, when everyone's counting the 49th day, you're only on to 48. And therefore, your, your Shavuos is going to be a day later. Okay, this is something which the Rebbe, uh, he was really reluctant to say people should do it. He said better not to travel, but it's uh, the pale people, you know, it's a very big ex To travel, let's say, from Melbourne to New York via the dateline is probably a third of the price or traveling all the way around the globe. So it's uh, far for, for parents who have several children in yeshivas in America. It's a very big, uh, significant, you know, significant amount of money. Uh, and so the people do cross the date line. And so then this fellow was, he didn't ask me about the travel. He asked me, okay, so I'm traveling. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to do Shavuos a day early. <clears throat> so on, 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 on Thursday, on Wednesday evening, everyone else has got still another day. For me, it's already Shavuos. All right, so I've got a couple of questions. One is, when it's for me, it's Yom Tov, And for everyone else, it's a weekday. Am I allowed to ask someone else to do Malacha for me? Am I allowed to ask someone to switch on the light, switch off the light, um, whatever it may be? So I said, so to do this, I said no. 
He asked, should I say Zman Matan Teir Aseinu in Shmoina Esra? And the Gera said no. That Yom Hei Lachaydesh is not Zman Matan Teir Aseinu. This the Rebbe also talks about in the Sicha. But the, this point about asking someone else to do Malacha for you. So here what we have in front of us is from the end of the halachas of lighting candles in Reish Samach Gimel. And the Alter Rebbe says that if you davened Mairi on Friday evening early, so let's say that the Kohol are davening at 8.30, and you daven at 7.30, so for you it's Shabbos. So you have a Kabbal Shabbos. But it's, uh, uh, at, at 8 o'clock, you can ask another Yid who hasn't accepted Shabbos yet, you can ask them to do Malacha for you, and you can enjoy the benefit from that Malacha on Shabbos. Why is that? Because for the one who's doing the Malacha, there's nothing for him, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing wrong for him. Yeah? For the one who's going to carry out your instruction, there's nothing, he's, there's nothing wrong with what for, for him. It's, it's, it's a weekday. Ah, you ask, what about, why can't we tell a goy for him also, or Shabbos is a weekday? But, all right, that's a separate thing. If you tell him at a time it's also for a yid to do melocha, so for all yid. And the same thing the author ever says, is, you're, it's after Mayrib. Last night we finished, Shabbos finished at 10.12, and we finished after bringing, finished about 10.30, thanks to the Shade and Igunim, etc. So now in that time, if someone... If I want to ask someone to do a malacha for me whilst I haven't ended my, my yom tov, so that's okay. Because, so here he says, so basically what the al is saying is that you may, if it's, if it's your voluntary addition to the Shabbos or yom tov, in that voluntary margin, you are able to delegate and ask another year to do malacha. That's what, here it's not so clear. In the Aaron Kudus Achrim, the Alter is more explicit. So if it's a voluntary margin, then in that voluntary margin, you could say, all right, I accepted Shabbos upon my person. I didn't accept my Shabbos beyond my person. So therefore, I can ask another year to do malacha for me. Whereas in our case, on Thursday, for this fellow, it's fully Yom And therefore, just... Therefore, therefore, the idea of, of shlichus, etc., would apply. And if he were, I mean, the way I understand, is he not allowed to ask another year to do malacha? The, we have discussed about what happens if a chutznik is in Eretz Yisrael. Is he allowed to ask a local to do malacha for him? And I'd said there are those who are mate, but that's not the same. Um, it's not the same because the uh okay that's because the whole idea of yom tov sheni has got to do with suffolk and the people in that's don't have the suffolk whereas here it's done to do with suffolk this is the real yom tov for you you mr hook just came from australia for you thursday is the full is the real yom tov and therefore you wouldn't be allowed to ask someone else to do malacha for you okay let's move on right so now There's this question we have on in Tfilas Haderech. Somehow I got into this conversation. Tfilas Haderech. So does one, so we, we, we have this, well, let's read from the Alter Rebbe Siddha, yeah? First of all. Tfilas Haderech, you should say it once you've already started traveling out of town on the first day. And then he says the rest of the days, you should, well, as long as you're en route, you, until you come home, you should say it every morning, um, but in, in, even in the hotel, but you sh should not say Hashem's name at the end. Baruch atosh shemei atfilo, without Hashem's name. So here's the question. I go somewhere for a week. And each day, the way, on the way out, I said tfilo saderech, um, whilst I was, you know, en route in the airport, I'm sorry, I said it in the airplane before before takeoff. However, we discussed that once before. Whilst I'm at my destination, every day I'm saying Tfil Sadarach in the morning after davening. I'm saying Tfil Sadarach. The question is, what about the return journey? Do I have to say Tfil Sadarach on the return journey with Hashem's name, 
or is that part of the original journey? And as therefore I say, without Hashem's name. And here we have the lotion of the Alter Ebe, Ad Shuvri Levese, until you come home. So that until you come home, we have in Hebrew, we have the expression Ad Ve'ad Bichlal or Ad Ve'loyad Bichlal. So the word says, until you can return home. Is that inclusive of the return journey? So I recall sitting in a car with Reb Chaim Faro, on the in Salanga Yard, also Reb Mendel Futafas Alavas Shalom. And I had traveled with the Mendel up to Manchester. And Rabbi Faro, who lived at the time in Manchester, was driving us back. And so then we had the question. See, he had to say to Phil Saderich, normally there's no question. The question was whether we, who are on our return journey, should we say to Phil Saderich with Hashem's name at the end or not? And Rabbi Faro was saying, it says, I'll show you the until you return home. So you don't you return. You don't make a bro, you don't say Hashem's name. And I was dismissing that and saying, no, I'm sure really it means until you're ready to go home. And Rebendel was more inclined to Rabbi Farah's Pshat. Um okay. Then I wrote about this in the Siddha, and subsequently Rabbi Ashkenazi. I wrote in Oliver Shalom of Mark Pakfachabad, he wrote the other way. And I'm going to go into some detail. Before going to Rav Ashkenazi, let's read the Shar HaKoilo. As we know, the Shar HaKoilo, written by Rabbi Avram David Lavut, the Rebbe's Elta Elta Zeda, Rav Nikolaev, and he wrote a commentary on the Alter Rebbe's Siddha. Anyway, let's read. The Cholzman Nesiyosai. For the duration of his journey, whether on the outgoing or the return journey, he should not mention Hashem's name only on the first day. So he was clearly saying that what Rabbi Farah was saying, that the return journey is part of the original journey, and you don't make Hashem, so don't say Hashem's name and feel Sadek on the return. Rav Ashkenazi wrote the opposite. Um, so let's let's explain a little bit. First of all, Tfilas Haderech is actually taken from Shmona Esra. We have discussed this before. In Shmona Esra, we have a Baruch Hashma Kileinu Berfin Shiza Baruch Atah Hashem Shemei Tfilo. Tfilas Haderech is uh, imagine if you were in the middle of Shmona Esra and you had to mention your, tfil, your, your journey. So you'd include it in Shemayat Phil. For this reason, Tfilas Adarach doesn't start off with Borch HaTar Hashem Elkein Melech Oilam, because it's an excerpt from Shemona Esra. For this reason also, Tfilas Adarach should be said standing, preferably. Um, the Alter Rebbe has this lotion over here, but Toiv Loi Mar Mu'umo Dim Efshebekal. If it's simple to achieve, you should say Tfilas Adarach standing, because it's like a, an excerpt from Shemona Esra. Now let's read from the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch in Simon Kufiud. Ein tzorich loyma tfilas haderech el opam achas v'chol yoyim shehu hoylech. You should be saying tfilas haderech every day that you are actually traveling. And if you take a break in the middle of the day and you then decide um, and then you can move on further, or you go back. That, then you'd, you won't say it again. If you decided to spend the night here, and then you change your mind, and you travel onwards. So then you'd have to say it again on that day as if you had spent the night there. Because since you decided to stay the, stay over, uh, to stay there, so then you had kind of broken the sequence of your journey. And therefore, when you resume to travel on the same day, you'd have to say Hader again. Now, if you hadn't done, then you'd want Tfilas Hader would cover for both journeys. There is here a question, and this is Rav Ashkenazi's discussion, 
Is tefillah saderech a tefillah for the day of traveling, or is it a tefillah for the journey? If it's for the day of traveling, so even you have several journeys in one day, they're all covered with the one. If you say it's a tefillah for the journey, then each journey, well, the, on the one hand, each journey, if it's two journeys a day, you'd have to say it twice. On the other hand, if it's a journey for five days, you don't have to say it once for the entire journey because it's all one journey. So these are these these are two ways of looking at it. So here again, in the Shukhan Aruch, Al Tareb had said you'd say it every day whilst you're en route. In the Siddha, he said no. On the first day you say it, and the other days you say it without Hashem's name. So he's taking the view on the Luchumra to say that the entire journey is is uh, is one. It has it deserves one bracha, one tefillah. With Hashem's name in it, at the, at the, I mean, at the end and the ending. Fine. Um, now, in the Chabad Siddur, the Alter Rebbe introduced that if you intend to return the same day, or Miyadi says it immediately, you should say, So, this is part of Rabbi Ashkenazi's argument to say, ah, you see that if you hadn't said that, then there would be a need to say a separate bracha for your return journey. So that is taking the view that each that, that, that the return journey is a separate journey, and therefore you'd have to make Tfil Saderech with Hashem's name in the return journey. So bottom line is, well, we have here the opinion of the Rabbi Rabbi David Lavut, that on the return journey you don't say Hashem's name, and you have the opinion of Rav Ashkenazi, who says that you should say Hashem's name in the Tfil Saderech on the return journey. Um, what was number four? Okay. I don't know why we don't have anything about number four. Okay. Um, so, if you remember last week, we had this whole discussion, I believe. What would happen uh, if you have last, this past Friday, and yeah, we laid, made it feel like we made an air of Tafshilin. We made an air of Tafshilin on Thursday to allow us to cook on Friday, to be able to put up a chant on Friday to be ready for Shabbos. Now, if you remember, the discussion was how ready does the chant have to be before the onset of Shabbos? Is it enough if it's a third cooked, as says in the Kitzah Shukhanar, or does it have to be fully cooked before Shabbos comes in? And if you remember, I had argued, perhaps passionately, that if you rely on this idea of a third cook being cooked in order to punish someone, so there's a fellow who cooked food a third of its readiness, and the question is, does he get capital punishment? And we say, well, since it fits for the bender of soy, therefore, we should give him, we, 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 we punish him for cooking. So if you are in, if you are relying on the bender soy for punishing someone, how much more so you should rely on the bender soy to not punish someone? In this case, the fellow who had put up a chont, which was a third cooked or half cooked before Shabbos, came, before the end of this day of Yom Tov. So why are you giving him malchus because he cooked on this day for the next day? Why don't you say, well, perhaps Bender Soy would have come and it would have been fit for the same day. That's That was my argument last week. And then, mulling it over, I'm, I'm seeing the, the argument the other way around, which I want to share with you. There are various areas in Halacha where we use a bit of, should we say, creativity. So, for example, in Hilchus Sukkah, we have that there's a there's a gap in the wall, and we'll say there's a concept of good asik that we can draw the the wall upwards as if there's a full wall. So we have used good asik. Then we have another halacha that if you have a the schach is not next to the walls, the schach is inset. So if there's less than dal damas, less than about six feet from the wall till where the schach is. So we say, imagine that the wall is bent. 
What would happen if you had a some kind of gazebo or something where you have a the wall only till 10 for him high till 85 centimeters high then there's a gap and then there's a ceiling and then further inset there's the sky would you also use the two so there the, the Haran says you cannot do two halachas at once you cannot in the same wall use Dwayfin Akumo and good asik. You, you can use creativity, but not you can't overdo it. And I, I want to apply something similar over here. All right. So on Yom Tif, if you cook for the following day, you won't get Malchus because it could have been some some guests who are unexpected might have come and therefore it's a fit for today. Yeah, that's true. But they're saying, but it's not I mean, those guests would come, it's not ready for them. Oh, well, there's someone called Ben Drosoy who eats the food even just half done. But to say that I'm going to not be punished because it might come guests, and it could be that that guest is going to be a Ben Drosoy, that is kind of making two assumptions. Just one similar concept. Generally, we follow the majority. There is a Reb Meir who says he is chayish lemiyuta. In many instances, he'll say we have to take the major, minority into consideration. But then we say even according to Reb Meir, but miyuta de miyuta, if it's a minority of minority, we don't take that in consideration. And that was really perhaps closer to our situation. Most likely, no one's going to come to your door. It's possible, it's possible that there will be some unexpected guests. Then the population, there are in the population some people who eat their food fairly raw, half done. But to say that the unexpected guests are going to be such people who are eat, you know, who eat a semi-cooked food, that's going for a, a, a mute, a mute. It's a, a, a very negligible minority. And therefore, that's not enough to acquit a person from being punished. Um, that's 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 my uh, understanding now, which um, which would therefore explain that that the the food which you are preparing on Friday food sh for Shabbos should be fully cooked before Shabbos comes in, rather than rely on the heter of a third cooked etc. So, let's move on. Right. So now we have our next question was, so here we have a situation that I'm going to use uh, a marshal, that there's two, there's a shliach who wanted to open a, a summer camp. There's another shliach who already runs a summer camp. And he says to the new entrepreneur that if you open a camp, it's going to affect my my clientele, my my my, my takings, and I've got invested you know, years and currently also into making my camp happen. And for you to make now a camp is to go, go to undercut mine. So the the entrepreneur says, but I've also invested significant money in. So far, even though I haven't launched it yet, but I have already invested time and effort and not so ready to step away from it. So the veteran Shliach says, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'll make you an offer. I'll cover your losses. I'll give you 5,000 euro. That should cover your losses. And so that was, a, that was okay, fine. So the entrepreneur said, okay, if, uh, if I'll, I'll accept that. And now, a week later, the veteran Shlia is talking with his accountant, etc. He has to pay out this 5,000 euro. And well, so there's count other, other committee members, and they, they're questioning, are, you, are, we, are we obliged to? So you, you, you were blackmailed. This fellow wanted to open a camp. And it would undercut you, and so he says, "If you don't, if I'm going, to, if you don't give me five thousand euro, I'll open a camp." So he blackmailed you. Are you, are you obliged 
to pay? That's really the question. You were you had made this commitment under duress. Are you obliged to pay that money? That's that is our question. So I spent some time on this. I'm not, I'm not saying what I'm saying is absolutely definitive, but I'm just going to share with you one perspective. I, the way I wrote it on the notes is about because of the element of Tzedakah. But the truth is, in this particular situation, both are Tzedakah monies, and whoever is going to receive, whoever is going to take, give is, is going to be communal funds regardless. It's not personal money. So there is a concept in Gemara of a fellow who was forced to sell. So the, he didn't want to sell this property. Or this article, and someone forced him. The, the expression is rather picturesque. Uh, pardon the expression. Taluhu and they hanged him. And he says, "Well, well I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to hang here for the rest of my, for the rest of my life, whatever's going to be left of it. But um, therefore, I'm ready to sell. To sell. And then is is taken off the hook literally. And then a week later, no, no, I never sold it." So is the sale valid? So is a sale under duress valid? Or for that matter, if the fellow says, give it to, give it to me as a gift. And under duress, he says, I'm giving it as a gift. So here we have in the Shukhan Aruch, in Chesh Mishpat, the following halach. Misha Anasuhu, one who was forced to the point that he sold something and he received the payment. Even if it was under duress, he was hanging until they until the sale took place. So the sale is valid. We say, listen, I know you valued your, your property, you received the money, and because you received the money, so under duress, true, but under duress, it means that you actually sold it. It's it's valid. It's okay, fine, done. That is true, Sif base, says the Shukhanar. That's true if it was a sale under duress. But if it was a gift under duress or a mechila, then the duress, then a week later he said, I know, I mean I, I didn't I didn't give it to you. I was under duress. I didn't mean it. So again, so if it's a sale, you received money, then the sale is binding, even though it's under duress. If it was a uh, a gift under duress, then you can claim it back. Sif Gimel says the following: If there was a dispute, and both had claims, and they came to a compromise. So then the compromise was, is dealt with as mecher, is dealt with as, as a sale. If it's a mechilo, just a waiver, <clears throat> that's a gift. So a waiver under duress is not valid, but a compromise under duress is valid. Of course, there's something very significant in here, and that is that the money has already been paid over. But meanwhile, what we're seeing is that a compromise under duress is valid. And part of the argument here is the one who both sides have got, inve have got inve invested money, etc. Uh, and, and each one in a compromise, each one is, is waiving some of what they have uh, and protecting something which they have. And... Therefore, there is something which they are getting as well as that, what they're giving. And because of that, the pshara is, 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 is binding, even though uh, it was under duress. There is a further detail in this, that if the, um, you know what, I'm just going to leave that, it's going to get much more complicated. But that, that's just, just my, this one perspective that what we're seeing here, that you cannot say, oh, I, the compromise was under duress, um, because the, the, the commitment was that both sides actually received something in return for the compromise.
Let's move on. Practical question. Lighting, uh, um, I have a restaurant and I've got a Goisha chef. What can I do to protect that the food cooked in the, in the kitchen should be considered Bishal Yisrael? Do, do I have to be there every time to light the fire, etc.? So let's read this carefully. This is now this two simonim. Kufyud Beis talks about bread, pas akum. Kufyud Gimel talks about bishul akum. That the, and these are two separate halachas. And we're going to see in a moment that the rules for bread are more lenient than the rules for cooking. And one of the simple reasons is that bread is a much more staple food. And therefore, there's more need to be uh, lenient. Cooking is, is not so staple. In addition, possibly that bread is a simpler product, not so likely to have non-kosher ingredients. I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm sorry, it's less, less likely, it's simpler. Cooking is a much more, more likely of having ingredients which may not be kosher. Be that as it may, so the Shulchan Aruch, Yosef Kara writes, the fact that someone light, that a Jew lights the fire and then it's counted as Jewish, a Jewish product, that's only for bread. But for other foods which are cooked, lighting of the fire by it, throwing a piece of wood in the fire, that doesn't make, doesn't make any difference. It's imperative that the Jew places the food on the fire. So here he says, if you have a, you want to cook in the goy's stove, you would have to put the food into the stove where it can cook. So this is the opinion of the Rabbi Yosef Karo, and this is how the Sfar did Paskin, that the fact that the Jew lit the fire does not help for Bishul Akum. So if you're really uh, very from Sfardi, it may very well be catering establishments which have got a fine Ashkenazi hersher, and yet for Svardu they may not be adequate. Now we have the Ramo who records the Minig Ashkenaz. There are those who disagree with the above, and they say that no, if they eat like the, the fire, if he pokes, pokes the embers, that also allows us to eat the cooking just like it allows us to eat the bread. And then he goes even further. Some say that even if the Jew did not poke the embers, didn't even throw a piece of wood, but the goiter, he lit the fire from the fire lit by it. That's also acceptable. And so this I've seen in some establishments that they have a yard site candle. And if the chef, the goisha chefs, if they need to fry an egg, whatever it may be, and the, the mashiach isn't there, so they'll know that they have to take the fire, not they can't ignite the fire themselves, and they take the fire from this yard site candle, and that's how they light the cooking. Now, this is what the Ramo is saying over here. There are those who say that even if the fire lit by the goy was lit from uh, it's the second generation from a jewish fire that is okay so here's the question the way it is worded is it saying that this is permitted is this lachatchila? can you call your restaurant mahadrin if you if you rely on this so looking around so it's you know, it's yes and then it's yes it goes it's level down and, and a level even more lenient. So again, the Mechaber says that if he lights the fire, it doesn't help. Yeshua Ramos says if he lights the fire, it does help. And then you have a th even, even more lenient that if a guy lights from the fire, but each Jew is also good. And he gives a reference to the Isser Veheter. Isser Veheter is, you know, bigger Yoyna something. Okay, so here's a quote from the Isser Veheter. Heshiv Maharam Shemuta Bdiyavit. If the fire was taken from yesterday, there was a fire and there was still a little bit left over. 
Yes, the day was lit by Eid. And then today, today's fire was lit from yesterday's fire. And then he says, So some I've seen some of Horshim who are who are playing down this heter and saying it's only Bidi Avid and it's not it's not really reliable. And they seem to have a point. But I'm, what I'm seeing actually in the Isava Heter, although the Maram allowed this Bidiyavet, but the last few words are saying actually it seems to be Lachachila. He says, If the non Jewish cook went to another, to another house, to a Jewish house, and took fire from there, the meaning is to allow that, to call that Bishal Yisrael. So it's not so straightforward. Um, here you've got the Aroch HaShulchan, which talks about the whole lot, the whole, all the kulas which Ashkenazim are doing to allow Bishul Akum to be called Bishul Yisroel. Heim kulis gedolis, they are great leniencies, as in um, stretching. Ve'ein roi lusimichalze, you shouldn't rely on them. Rak v'shasat chak, only when you're stuck and if it's within a, a Jewish home. So bottom line is using a can, uh, having a candle there to avoid visual akum is that allowed? I would say the answer is yes. Is it mahadrin? I guess the answer is no, because there are those who say that it's not not adequate. And certainly for Sfaradim, but even for Ashkenazim, there are those who are not very happy with it. I've got there were about the pilot light, but I haven't thought that through carefully. Whether that makes any difference, whether that's, whether that's different to and the, the candle. Right, so here we had a, a question last week, one morning, it was Thursday morning, Erev Yom Tov, and there was only nine people in shul. And then, eventually, well, the nine people davened on their own, and then the t Mr. Ten comes in, and there's ten minutes, it's like, so there's, there's a few, few people saying, listen, I can't stay, I have to get to work, I can stay here ten minutes. So here we have the question, what should we do? Should we do Kriyas HaToyra, it's a Thursday morning, or should we have, and one of the people is ready to say Ashkenesra aloud, and we'll be able to say Kedusha. So here's the question, which is a greater priority, Kedusha or Kriyas HaToyra? So I did not find this question explicitly addressed, but here we have the Sefer Ishe Yisrael, it's a specialist Sefer on Tefillah, and he says the following scenario. You've got a person who's in hospital and he's given the permission to leave the hospital for a short while. So he has a choice. Should he go to Daven with the Tzibur or to Kriya Satayra? So he says you should go to, um, he should go for Tefillah, but Tzibur is more important than Kriya Satayra, which is not exactly our question. Our question is Kedusha or Kriya Satayra. Here's the question of Tefillah at Sibur Kriya Satayr. And so it's interesting, he says that, Kriya, that, that Tefillah at Sibur is more important than Kriya Satayr. He gives a reference to Minchas Yitzchak, and just to prove how important it is to look everything up. This is a Minchas Yitzchak, look at that quote. I'll call upon him, but you did down, that you can't fulfill both of them, Tefillah and Kriya Satayr at Sibur, you should daven at home bekavona, and he should go to hear Kriyas Hatoyer b'tzibur. So I don't know how this Rabbi Foifer, which is a very good sefer, but he seems to have somehow found the Minchas Yitzchak something quite opposite to what I read over there. Here he's saying he should daven at home and go for Kriyas Hatoyer, and he himself, and the and the Rishi Yisrael is saying the other way around, better to daven b'tzibur than Kriyas Hatoyer. Um, one more point is, in my thoughts, is that there's a famous shuva of the Tzmach Tzedek. It's on Hanukkah, and you're davening a little bit behind the chasm, and you have a choice. You realize, if I'm going to say al Hanisim, I won't be able to say Nakdishoch, to say Kedusha with a minion, because I'll still be in the middle of Sim Sholem, let's say. Perhaps I should skip Al-Hanissim. In this way, I'll be able to manage to be 
into during the Kainat Torah, let's say, and answer Kedusha. So this is the, the dilemma. And in the process of the argument, that Tzimach Tzedek quotes here from the Rebchaim Vital, that saying Kedusha, saying Kedusha is a mitzvah of the Torah, according to the Zohar. The Kaddish Moi B'Nakdishach. To sanctify Hashem's name by Nakdishach. So according to the Zohar, for Rebchaim Vital at least, that Kedusha is Min Um, But then he shows other sources, Hoskim, where it's to, Kedusha is not Min HaToyer. To finish off that point, the Simach Tzedek says not to skip. You do what you're doing, you say Yala Nisim, the fact that you'll miss out Kedusha, you'll say Kedusha in, in mind, he, that's, that's his Maskana, his conclusion over there. But he does pick up the Kedusha's the Kedusha's Daraisim. Um, I want to just add another, I, I, my feeling is that in our weekday Kriya Satoira, the same material which you're going to read today, you're going to read on Shabbos. Therefore, I felt that the same Kedusha would have greater uh, hashivas, greater priority than doing a Kriya Satoira. Um, you can see that he seems to be saying the opposite, but all right, it's, it's not such a clear, not, not such a clear uh, halacha, and whichever way is done is done. What's interesting is that they, the, the follow on from that question was if they did Kriya Satira and then they said, they said, what about Kaddish after that? So at first I was wondering whether to say Kaddish because it's not after Davani. But I'm just look actually it's today's Shir Rambam in three prokim a day. He talks about whenever, whenever there's a, a tzibur, he says the tzibur say the seder ayoyim. So when one says kaddish, I don't know what that's dafka of shat in in, in the Rambam, but a tzibur has said a tefillah together. It justifies saying kaddish. Ah, it says since the skabel tzloisoyim, which means that, that our shmona esra should be accepted. Well, it's true. These people did down from us, although not as a group. But I don't think there's any harm in saying uh, in saying Tzkabot Sloyson. The Kaddish per se, I think, is justified because people did say a prayer together. And the detail of Tzkabot Sloyson is in, 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 I don't see it's such a problem. Let's go and we have another couple of minutes. Um, so here we have a question about the Science Museum in, I believe it's in Kensington somewhere. So apparently there are human remains in on display in glass vaults. And the question was, are Koyanim allowed to enter the Science Museum? Now, first of all, we know a Koyan mustn't make himself impure to a dead body. But there's two levels. There's touching and there's what's called oihel, coming under the same roof. Of course, Touching if a, a koyan to touch a dead body, even as a goy, is is making him tommy. It's not allowed. What about tumas oyel? So there are those sources in Chazal which say odom ki yomas bo oyel atem kruim odom ve'enev digachavim kruim odom. That odom ki yomas that tumas oyel only refers to a Jewish, the body of a Jew. Yet here you have a shulchan um, which is saying that that. Kivre, I think Shinaim Base, I think Shinaim Hay, somewhere on the inner yard there, that graves of Goyim, no choin mi zoher ha koyin mi is appropriate that a koyin should be cautious and not tread over them. It's, it's, it's not a strong language. It's actually saying it's highly recommended not to. It's not saying it's absolutely forbidden. And then there are more ads in the Rashi writing, Apopish Yesh Mikilim. There are those who say it is permitted because a, 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 it's a, a, a goy does not cause too much oil, no choin lahachme. One should take the strict view. Okay, so overall, uh, for a goy, sorry, for a koyin to go into a building where there's a non Jewish corpse is not recommended. Highly not recommended. Fine. The question here is does the vault being a large box. So sometimes we have the idea that a 
a uh, an oil will be able to contain the tumor and it doesn't go beyond. So if you have a tumor on the lower floor, it doesn't necessarily go to the upper floor if there's a, a separating a level between the two floors and so on. So there is actually this very question was put to Reb Moshe Sternbuch, who's today the uh, Bezdin, uh, in, in uh, of the Eide Haredis in Shalim, used to be known as the London Ilui, and he gives various arguments. And uh, well, one of them is that about the glass vault not being not allowing Tumor to go out. And then he's a bit he's not so sure because the glass vaults are held at the corners with metal, and therefore that sh should communicate communicate Tumor. He, he does play it down. He does not give a total green light, but he does play down the problem and saying that sometimes we say, so if tumor not says, that if there's a tumor, a mace in a, in, a, in a room, so since it's eventually going to be taken out through this passage, so then the whole passage is Tommy because so if tumor not says. So here, he creatively, he argues in this museum, they have no intention of taking it out. So you can't use the argument of so if tumor not says because it's actually, for all intents and purposes, is going to remain here. So bottom line is he's he, he is inclined to permit it, but he's asking for other people to, to join him in giving a definitive permit, per, permit because he's not totally confident on his own. One last thing which we have for today, and that is someone asked me, can may one make butter on Yamtu? So how would you make butter? If you take the cream off the milk and you shake it up um, vigorously for quite a few minutes, so then you'll be able to create butter. So are you allowed to do that on Yom Tov? What about making butter on Shabbos? Would, sh would that be a malocha? So again, I couldn't find this. But making cheese, making cheese is also under the actually under the heading of boine, of building. I'm wondering whether the word givino has got anything to do with the word boine. But the reason for that is building means taking components and bringing them together into a mass, creating a structure where made of many components. That's what building is. That's why making a plat. In hair is also coming under coming under boina. We've discussed this before, and so too uh, making cheese is boina. In my mind, a block of butter or a block of cheese is the same thing. So I see it as being boina. On yom tov, the question is, well, you're allowed to cook on yom tov, so would you be allowed to make? Therefore, the question is, would you be allowed to make butter on yom tov? So here I'm reading from the first simon in Hilchas Yom Tov in the Alter Rebbe, in Tov Sadikay. And the discussion here is that any malocha, any labor, which is normally done for several days supply at once, that must not be done on Yom Tov. That's why I'm not allowed to pick the apples off my apple tree, because it's normal to pick apples for several days supply. That's why I'm not allowed to grind grain to uh, um, horseradish, because it's normal to make horseradish for a few days supply at once, and so on. Then he writes here, the osru chalivas habehema. The chachomim forbade us to milk an animal. The fish gam he nasis the tsoirich achilas yomim rabim. Because the milking would also be done for supply for for many days. Share odom choiliv called soinoi beyachat. It's normal for a person to milk all his sheep at once. I, 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 I've struggled to understand what does it mean because my uh, my understanding is that cows, for example, are milked every day. So what does it mean that it is normal to do a milking for several, for many days supply? My understanding is that he's talking here about milking to make cheese. So I've got, I've got a, a, a flock of sheep. And meanwhile, most of the time, the sheep are going to feed them the lambs, and so their milk is being going to be taken by, by the, their little ones. From time to time, I will milk all the sheep, and I'll take that milk and use it for making for making um, 
I'll use it for making uh, cheese. And so that milking is not the daily milking. It's a milk, it's an occasional milking for several days supply at once. That's where we have uh, a problem that it shouldn't be done yom tov. So coming back, I think making butter is obviously butter is something which is made for a few days supply at once. And therefore, that would not be allowed to be done on Shabbos. I'm oh, sorry, on, on Yom Tov. Shabbos is not out of the question, but even on Yom Tov, that would not be okay. I noticed, uh, thank you, Pinchas, I missed out question number eight. But I think I did, I did address that. That do they say, that was going back, do you say uh, Kaddish after, uh, if they did not have a minion, Moshman Esser, they did Kriya Satayra, and they said of all the and so I said that, 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 that I, I'm, I'm okay with them saying how this is coming. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Wish you a good night and we should meet in good health and Simchas Hagula, Simchas Elam al Thank you. Thank you.